The Kansas landscape stretched before us as we rumbled down the highway in our RV, laughter echoing through the vehicle. We were a group of friends on a road trip seeking adventure and the thrill of the unknown. Little did we know that our journey would lead us to a place that defied all expectations. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the plains, we stumbled upon a seemingly idyllic campground that didn't appear on any of our maps. The air was thick with an otherworldly tranquility, and the surroundings exuded a serene charm that drew us in. Excitement bubbled within us as we decided to make an impromptu stop and set up camp for the night. The RV eased into a vacant spot surrounded by towering trees that whispered in the gentle breeze. As we unpacked and prepared for the night, we couldn't help but notice the other campers nearby. They sat around their flickering campfires, but something was off. Strangely silent, never making eye contact like ghostly apparitions lingering in the shadows. Unsettled but intrigued, we decided to explore the campground, attempting to strike up conversations with our mysterious neighbors. However, our attempts were met with eerie silence, and their humanoid forms seemed frozen in an unnatural stillness. The air grew heavy with a sense of foreboding as we realized something wasn't right. Determined to unravel the mystery, we tried to contact the local populace. Our attempts to make calls were met with static or strange, incomprehensible whispers. Frustration and fear gnawed at us as we exchanged worried glances. It was then that we noticed something deeply unsettling about the inhabitants of this phantom campground. They were not human. As the truth dawned upon us, a cold shiver ran down our spines. The humanoid figures around us were like reptiles in disguise, their eyes cold and unblinking. Panic set in as we grasped the gravity of the situation. Without a word, we turned towards the RV and ran, our footsteps echoing through the eerily silent campground. Back at the safety of our RV, hearts pounding, we locked the doors and peered through the windows. The realization that we were not alone, that something beyond our understanding lurked in the shadows, sent a chill through our veins. We struggled to comprehend the bizarre encounter, the reptilian figures etched into our memories. Fear compelled us to put pedal to the metal, the RV roaring to life as we sped away from that surreal campground. The highway blurred beneath us as we left the phantom place behind. Safe distance did little to ease our terror, and silence settled within the RV as we grappled with the inexplicable. As the miles stretched between us and that mysterious spot in Kansas, we exchanged haunted glances. The truth behind the phantom campground remained elusive, leaving us with an inexplicable fear that clung to our hearts. We couldn't explain what had happened, only that we had narrowly escaped a place where the line between reality and the unknown blurred in the most chilling of ways. Navajos growing up on the reservation hear about skinwalkers from time to time. For this reason, nearly everyone is cautious about who they trust or what kinds of things they talk about because Yenad Lucias are dangerous people that have the abilities of animals, yet retain their cunning human minds. My mother has many tales to tell of Yenad Lucias, skinwalkers. She tells us because she wants us to be aware that there are people out there that may want to hurt us or play with our minds. She sometimes tells it to assure me that there is a God and he watches over everyone, even little Navajo children. This true story, which happened in the 1960s, is one of them. One night, she and her four sisters, my aunts, were at home after a long day of shepherding and doing chores. My mom and her sister needed to use the bathroom before going to bed, and so they decided to go to the outhouse together. They didn't have plumbing back then, or running water, as they were living in a traditional hogan. The outhouse was far away, and they didn't want to walk there alone in the darkness, so they decided to go together. It was relatively late. The sole light source was moonlight, 
As the two finally neared the outhouse, they thought they heard some faint sounds like that of whistling. It was bird-like, but whoever was whistling was following them and was circling the area. They clung to each other, chilled by the sound, and continued on. Oddly enough, the outhouse door was open. Usually, when people use the outhouse, they always latch or wire the door shut. As they came close enough to the outhouse, they saw a large black thing sitting inside. Though they couldn't see its features, they could make out that it was human in nature. Terrified, they screamed in horror and ran back to the Hogan as fast as their legs could carry them. They could hear someone chasing them from behind and that it was gaining on them. As soon as they reached the Hogan, they dashed in and slammed the door. They hurriedly told their other sisters what happened, and they sat in silence, waiting for something to happen. The Hogan door wasn't secure. It was only an old, worn-down door with no knob. It had a rickety latch nailed to the inside of the door to keep it closed. Nothing was burring the smoke hole where the chimney rose out. It was open to the air, and you could see the night sky. The person outside began banging on the walls, making all five of them huddle in the middle of the room near the stove. There were heavy objects being thrown now, and a lot of noise. Soon they heard it climb onto the roof. Whoever it was was walking back and forth, and every now and then it would peer through the smoke hole at them, its face hidden by darkness. There were adults present, but being a rather rude foster family with kids of their own, they lived in another Hogan some distance away. Though they tried calling out to them, they became angry and didn't answer. Finally, in pure desperation, my mom's three older sisters, being raised Catholic in boarding school, told her and her younger sister to get down on their knees. They began praying to God for protection. One of them had acquired holy water from the church, and she sprinkled it near the door. All night, the skinwalker would circle the Hogan, pound on the door, and make that whistling noise, but even though the Hogan was improperly secured, that skinwalker never got to break in and hurt them. My mom never found out who tried to hurt them that night. Medicine men can hold a chant for you, to see who tried to hurt you, but this was never carried out. Looking back on it now, my mom says that nobody was protecting them that night. Nobody but Heavenly Father and that he kept them safe from harm's way. The Yenayadlishes would bother them off and on, but not once were they harmed. When my now wife and I first started dating, we would take long walks through our very small town after I got off work at 11 p.m. We would wander through the cemetery, down little country roads, everywhere, but our favorite area was a large field where the stars were incredible. One night we were watching a small meteor shower and heard all kinds of loud grunting and ruckus coming from a tree line. We had nowhere to go and we're starting to get concerned. A large angry Bigfoot came out, stared at us, and then quietly walked away. I don't think we breathed for several minutes. I was convinced he was coming at us and there was no way to outrun him. We didn't go back there for a few days. I drove to a park to go hiking at night in the mountains. So safe, I know. And I hadn't even turned off my car, and I already feel like I'm being watched. There weren't any cars around, so I thought maybe it was just me being paranoid for some reason. But for some reason, I look to my right, and I see this weird-looking humanoid shape on top of the little bump hill, about 50 feet away. At first, I thought it was a weirdly shaped tree, until I saw the arms move, no wind at all. So now I know there's a person staring at my car, trying not to move, for what I assume is for me to get out of my car and leave to a more secluded area, as we were next to the road. Of course I left. I don't go hiking at night in that particular park anymore. I had received reports of a bunch of noise at the far northeastern section of the park. I was personally called to investigate myself. I brought it to the ranger in charge at the time, and he agreed it would be a good idea for me to go out there during patrols. 
I took it upon myself to join the other ranger on patrol that evening. The reports were something of screaming at them from behind the trees along one stretch of road near the campsite for several nights in a row. It was described as sounding vaguely human, but also not human. There were two male witnesses, and I made it my mission to speak with them myself. When we got into that section of the park, it was getting dark. By the time we reached where they had been camping previously, it seemed like it might take us a little while to find any evidence. Since it had been about three days since those initial reports, the ranger I was with, whom we'll call Frank, and I split up. He headed off to the left, and I headed off to the right, where it seemed like there would be less dense vegetation. I continued walking, calling out intermittently, hoping to find somebody assuming they were behind the screaming. I would call back every few minutes, and Frank replied saying he was on his way back, but found nothing so far. I got about another 200 yards in, when all of a sudden it sounded like something nearby had crashed through some brush, running. Now normally this wouldn't have been an issue, except it sounded like a very large biped coming towards us. I immediately started heading back in the direction of the vehicle, not really wanting to see what was coming. It didn't take a genius to realize that what it sounded like was coming for me. Once I heard this, I did my best to outrun what could turn out to be a bear, or maybe a mountain lion, or maybe worst of all, what others had considered a Sasquatch previously. Before departing from camp that night, Frank had joined me just as we reached our vehicle parked roughly 80 yards away from where he'd been searching when he responded earlier. By this point, there were loud noises everywhere around us, making it impossible now to hear each other without speaking very loudly. The forest was alive with these screams. I quickly suggested we get back into the vehicle. I was not waiting around. We immediately started driving back towards base ops, which was about 15 minutes away from where we were currently stationed on patrol. My heart was racing the entire time. The forest and the night were alive with these creatures or something going on. I was told to write up a detailed report of what had happened to us out there and even gave detailed sketches of the creature that I saw that night, even though I barely did. Frank, however, was questioned. He had very well seen the creatures I did not see between the fear and the shaking. It took quite a bit of time for him to convince himself that he was not hallucinating and that he did indeed see something dangerous. This was all eventually resolved when we decided and were told not to talk about it. I think we, as rangers, accepted that there might be some theories about the mythical Bigfoot and that they are indeed a reality. Of course, this only led to more questions and speculation than actually having fruitful full answers. Let's just say we finished our patrols without incident after that and shared stories of other strange things happening. I'm pretty sure that made believers out of us. At least it did for me. In 1989, I was a U.S. Marine stationed at Camp Pendleton in Southern California as a platoon guide for Company B, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. I lived on the base in Oceanside. I was a corporal, and being a second lieutenant meant it was impossible for me to have a roommate due to space limitations. My chief brought it up with me that I could live with him and his wife off the base if he wanted to. We were pretty close, so he offered it. It was here that the encounter really begins. I'll start with the first one. Living with the chief and his wife wasn't so bad at first, but where they lived, we started to get how do I say, nightly visits by these things. It started by hearing them just outside the window at night. I would hear heavy footfalls, branches breaking, lots of leaves crunching around. They would always be right over my window. I would just lay there, staring at the closed curtains, praying that whatever it was would just go away. I would always fall asleep before they did every night. It was the same thing, except one night I woke up to them just outside the window, breathing heavily on the glass while watching me, drool and saliva all over the window. I'm not gonna lie. This was downright terrifying. I was a Marine, for God's sakes. I'm supposed to be able to protect myself. 
After that night, it was as if they knew I'd seen them. They would come every night, but always to the front portion of the property where we had the largest windows and viewing portion of the front property. It's like these things wanted to be seen. I can never go back to sleep after that, so I would just stay up and wait for them to leave. These encounters continued on for several weeks. I had my other best friend, whom I'll call C. He was invited over to spend the night as well. It was around two um, when these things approached. I heard the usual noises outside the window, but this time it sounded like more than one. I would see shadows pass by my bedroom window. Of course, my chief seemed totally clueless to all this and would spend his nights drunk as a skunk passed out in front of the TV. Go figures. C is another story. He is a Marine veteran who had seen action in the Gulf War, and he knew what we were dealing with. I befriended him while on base, and we ended up meeting in the chow hall, where we became really good friends. So with all this going on, I would invite him over, and my chief did not mind. I think my chief is pretty clueless to these things going on, since he was always drunk and passed out by the time these things would show up. And after he was drunk, good luck waking him up. I would always ask C what it is we should do. He informed me that we were dealing with a very large, upright, bipedal canine, and these things are alpha predators. They will kill. He had dealt with these himself while living up in Michigan for a short while. I went back to my chief and told him what was going on. He laughed it off, said I was delusional. So at this point, I'm pretty convinced that he has no idea. It was at this point that I became very suspicious of him, that he didn't know anything. I think he was living in denial. After a few weeks of this, I was going to go live with my wife's sister up in San Diego. Now comes the best part of this experience. The first night, I didn't sleep there. I expected these things to be there right outside my window, although they never were. To say that first night at my new location was restless and sleepless is an understatement. I didn't realize in hindsight how this thing would really affect my overall sleep patterns. Anyway, I'm not sure what it was that I experienced that day, but it was something else. I'm still completely spooked by the whole thing, just thinking back to it. I would prefer it if it just gets left in the past. It was a warm night in Texas, and I was on my usual route as a professional trucker transporting wood logs from one town to another. The endless stretch of highway had always been a familiar sight. As I drove along the deserted highway, my headlights cutting through the darkness, I noticed two glowing lights in the distance on the road ahead. Intrigued, I thought it might be another vehicle or maybe even a couple of deer crossing the road. I didn't think much of it at first and continued driving, expecting the lights to disappear as I got closer. However, as I approached, the lights didn't fade away. In fact, they seemed to grow brighter and more defined. My curiosity turned into a sense of unease as I realized that the glowing lights were coming from a creature standing in the middle of the road. At first glance, the creature seemed human, like, but its size was something I had never encountered before standing at an imposing height of eight to nine feet, or maybe even taller. Its eyes were the most striking feature, large and shaped like those of a cat, unlike anything I had ever seen before. The creature's entire being was so black and dark that it seemed to absorb the very light around it. As I got closer, I noticed what appeared to be a cloak covering its body, blending seamlessly with a dark toboggan-like cap that obscured most of its head. The creature was incredibly skinny, almost emaciated, and its eyes shimmered with an eerie shine. Strangely, it seemed to be standing motionless, staring straight ahead as if focused on something intently. I pulled my truck to a halt, unable to believe my eyes. I had seen my fair share of strange sights during my time on the road, but this was something entirely different. The air around me felt charged with an inexplicable energy and a chill ran down my spine. Suddenly, as if sensing my presence, the creature turned its head toward me. It was as though it could see through the darkness and directly into my soul. 
Fear gripped me, and I felt a primal instinct to escape this inexplicable encounter. Without a moment's hesitation, I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, hoping to put as much distance between me and the creature as possible. My truck roared to life, and I sped away with reckless abandon, my heart pounding in my chest. The creature reacted instantly, letting out an ear-piercing shriek and breaking into a fast and unnatural sprint, chasing my truck like a nightmarish zombie from the movies. My heart raced, and the adrenaline coursed through my veins as I pushed my truck to its limits, desperate to escape the horrifying encounter behind me. I didn't dare look back. I just kept driving until the glowing lights were nothing but a fading memory. As I left that nightmarish scene behind, I couldn't help but wonder what I had just witnessed. Was it some otherworldly being? An alien or something beyond my understanding? I had no answers, but one thing was certain. I would never return to that road again. I worked as a technician in 2001 for the Joint Warfare Analysis Center in Suffolk, Virginia. That's not to say that I was a government employee because all of us there were contractors or civil service personnel. I'd been with the company for four years by this time and had risen to the position of a security system specialist. My job was basically to work with a sensitive compartment information facility, a secure and sensitive room where information is handled. In the case, we were working with U.S. intelligence assets in theater during the lead, up to Operation Enduring Freedom, the invasion of Afghanistan. One of the things I saw during my time was a report generated by some assets on the ground in Afghanistan, having to do with an assimilation of alien life. I've heard all the same complaints that you people say about how the government lies for the people for nefarious purposes. Well, I'm going to divulge a little bit more to that. I was the second one in the morning, usually arriving at seven hours after having already dropped off my son. I always came back in the door of the facility to the security checkpoint. All visitors were expected to enter through there, and it was always under video surveillance 24-7. The main door from the outside wall next to the parking lot was unlocked during my arrival, and there would be two workers standing guard on either side of the door. Nobody was allowed to stand at the door alone, and both members of the entry team were required to swipe their badges for the reader before the door would unlock. This is due to the things that come in this section of the building. We got things from the NSA, CIA, and military, among other things things that civilian eyes are never allowed to see. I think this was some kind of alien technology or biological entity the military picked up during their numerous operations over there. We received some interesting stuff during my time there, like a live alien foreign specimen of an unidentified species. Although I never saw it myself, nobody was allowed in the room when the specimen was being worked on. In the security section of our facility, there were always at least three technicians with access to that room. The specimen came on a military cargo flight, although they never told us which one. It was kept in a large sealed container, which had been airtight welded shut. Inside the container, there was this alien being. The military brass told us it was an alien life form, but none of us newer guys ever really saw it. The specimen was roughly four feet tall, humanoid, with a large head. It was kind of broad across the shoulders. Nobody ever told us what type of being it was. It was just an alien conscripted by the military to be studied for battlefield applications. The one thing people did tell us about this stuff was that the brass didn't know exactly how it worked but that we were to lock down the facility and let nobody in or out under any circumstances until they did know how it worked. We were all a bunch of 20-something technicians, so our contact with the higher-level brass was pretty much limited to the briefings they would give us just about how to set up each new artifact or specimen that we got. During the initial setup, one of the guys from upstairs showed us how to set up a safe room for this particular specimen, they told us that it was a biological entity and that there were always ways to keep it safe. 
There was a large bay with several smaller rooms inside that we could use for this exact purpose. The safe room was a large sealed cube with several layers of sheet metal on the outside and airtight welded doors on the inside. It was designed to keep things in and out. This room would be used for any specimen with the immediate high-level containment requirement. During the brief, they told us that the entity inside could very easily escape if we're not extremely careful on how it was handled. They stressed that we were not able to open the doors for any reason, and under no circumstances could anybody be inside with it. I think this was because it could emit some kind of energy that would open the door if left unattended. They also said something about how it's programmed to escape. The way the room worked is that they would slide one of those large square biohazard suits through a chute on the outside of the door. We would then have to put on these suits, go inside with the large toolbox, and slide the inner door shut from the inside before sealing it from the inside with a large metal brace. The toolbox would be used to open a panel on the inside door and access the locking mechanism of the room. The biohazard suits were used for this because there was no way to ensure the entity could not pass through. The first time I had to go inside was with another guy named Craig. Everybody was still really new at this, and everybody was sense. Nobody knew exactly what to expect. The outside of the room was huge, maybe 20 feet wide by 30 feet long. Craig and I walked into the small antechamber, and we could see this large metal brace running horizontally across the door. The safe room itself was built like a vault with several metal walls roughly 18 inches thick. I eased the toolbox to the chute and slid it over to Craig, who was standing near the door inside. Craig slid the inner door shut before fiddling with the locking mechanism for just a few seconds. I closed the small toolbox, opened up the panel inside to reveal a keyhole, and slid the brace into place. I closed the door before turning the key over in the lock. The room was now very, very quiet. We would receive several more live specimens of beings sent directly from the military, Pentagon, and other branches that were housed in the same complex. By the time I was done with this job, we had nearly a dozen of these rooms and an uh, assortment of other artifacts from around the world. Most of the specimens were pretty bizarre, even for a freak like me. I saw some things that you just can't unsee. They would take everything away in the middle of the night, while we were sleeping, usually while I was still up drinking, because after seeing those things, nothing can make you sleep. This complex continued its operation until the very beginning of 2003, January, where they were moving the complex over to France. Unless you're okay with transferring, you'd have to find other means of work. I declined the invitation to go there, so I have no idea what's become of that facility. But I'm sure from what I've been told by some guys that did decide to move over there, that the facility is much larger and houses many more things. They even joke about it and call it the little house of due to some of the specimens they have over there. I have kids and family, so I can't really talk about all the specimens I saw, just in case I ever get threatened or my family gets threatened. Sorry, these memories of working there still stand out to me as some of the craziest times. My dad and I went backpacking a few years back. We got to the trailhead later than we had planned and decided we were going to start the hike anyways. Four hours later, the sun is going down and we still had over an hour left till we got to a suitable site to drop down. We're now hiking in the dark with our headlamps when we hear a low growl 20 or so feet off the trail from us. Then we heard something large moving through the underbrush and trees. We both looked at each other and basically ran up the trail as best we could in the dark on a rocky hill. It was 15 minutes before we stopped to catch our breath. Never saw it, but hearing it so close by gave me a shot of primal fear that I didn't know I had. My dad and I went on a hunting trip in upstate New York where it's common to see a bear or two. We visited a reserve, explored lakes and outposts, and overall it was fun. 
However, while in one of the towers, we spotted a furry thing about 200 yards away in the trees and bushes. Hunters aren't allowed to shoot off the outposts, so we didn't think much of it at the time. Later, when we set up camp, we heard footsteps around the tent. I didn't pay much attention, assuming it was a deer or a squirrel, and went back to sleep. But it started getting weirder, with heavier and faster circling footsteps. I woke my dad, and we both went outside in our boxers with our guns. However, we couldn't see anything, and the noise stopped. Thinking I was going mental, I apologized to my dad, and we went back to bed. The next day, as we continued our journey, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I felt unsettled, but my dad didn't notice anything off. We set up camp again and saw the hairy thing once more. We watched it for a while until it disappeared and we went to bed. But an hour or two later, we heard something different, heavier, faster footsteps that sounded like multiple beings. Panic set in and I woke my dad up. We both grabbed our guns and my dad went outside, shining his flashlight and yelling to scare off whatever was there. I was terrified and had tears in my eyes. We decided to leave immediately, packed up the tent and started our hike back to the truck. During the hike, we heard knocking sounds all around us, making us even more anxious. We half jogged towards the truck, but my dad couldn't run due to a knee injury. At this point, I was on high alert, ready for anything with my gun in hand, fueled by adrenaline. As soon as we saw the truck, a blood-curdling scream pierced the air, making us run even faster. We drove to the nearest ranger outpost and reported the incident. The rangers mentioned similar reports, and my dad briefly described what he saw. A seven, eight feet tall creature with a human face and a hairy body. He said there were four of them, but he doesn't like to talk about it often. Sorry for the long story. We were in Wales in 1992 for training exercises that we were to spend the night in the woods on the outskirts of a small town, then head into town for some R&R. &R. As usual, we were eating field rations and had just broken out onto our sleeping bags for the night, and we heard something large moving throughout the woods. A few of the guys from my platoon grabbed their rifles and went to investigate. A minute or two later, the most awful sound I'd ever heard came from the woods. It sounded like somebody trying to scream while being strangled, maybe 50 yards away at most. It wasn't human or animal in nature, but it was loud. To this day, I struggle to find the words to describe it. It shook me up. A few minutes later, the guys came back from checking out the woods. They did not have a clue what it was. One guy swore he saw something weird. But he was also pretty shaken up, too. We just need to forget about it, and I said we can't just forget about it. I don't know what it was, but there's a chance it was a person. We need to go make sure. The guy who looked just seemed shaken and pale told me it was no person. I'm telling you, whoever it was, they're long gone by now. Well, I'm not just going to sit here and do nothing, I told them. If you guys are too scared to go back there, then I'll go check it out. At this, a few of the guys who had gone into the woods shook their heads, but most of them just stared at the ground. I'm going to go back there, I told them. So one of my friends who was with me in the platoon told me he would come with me, even though he did have a lack of enthusiasm. The rest of the platoon was less reluctant, and so we all headed back there, minus a few guys, of course. We were not successful. Nothing was found, but we felt like we weren't alone out there in the wilderness. Anyway, that's my story. Haven't experienced anything else in the military quite like it. I've been a ranger for a while now. I've seen a lot of crazy things, and most of it's classified, and I can't talk about it. I'll tell you about one, though. I was driving my patrol car down the highway, and I received a call over the radio that really freaked me out. They had reported that somebody had said their friends were being attacked by something at one of the campsites. I drove over as fast as possible to see what was happening. When I arrived, I saw several cars parked around the campsite, where everybody seemed very nervous about everything. 
The people who were supposed to be camping here weren't anywhere to be found, but they had left behind all their belongings, so it did not seem like they packed up and went home for anything like that. A couple of them were huddled together. They informed me that something very large had attacked them while they were sleeping, and it must have taken one of their friends away. I kept my gun close on me, looking around for anything suspicious. I noticed some very large footprints on the ground along with some blood stains leading into the woods. The footprints belong to what many people call Bigfoot, even though it's not like any Bigfoot I've ever seen. It was one of the really big ones. There couldn't have possibly been a bear. I didn't see any of the claw marks or teeth marks anywhere, but more importantly, just the massive size of the footprints alone were startling. I got the call on the radio for backup, but nobody was answering me. I thought maybe they were busy with something else that must have been preventing them from helping. Then, I heard a scream off in the distance. It sounded like there were people yelling for help over at another campsite. At this point, I cannot wait any longer. I sent somebody back to their car to get a rifle while I continued on down the path leading into the forest with blood. When I made it to where the screaming was coming from, what I saw will never leave my memory. Whatever I was looking at had to have come from hell. It had three eyes and looked almost like a human, but covered in nasty hair. I can't really describe it to you, but I've never seen anything like this before in my life. There was a family who were having a camping trip with kids, and now they were all gone. The creature had taken all of them. I decided to shoot at it quickly, but I know my bullets would not even slow it down. Whatever this thing was, it could not be killed by normal means. I don't usually talk about my job around other people, but how could I not tell people about what I saw? At least those willing to listen. It was easily one of the most terrifying things I've ever experienced in my entire life. After that day, there were not many reports of unexplainable events happening around these campsites. It's almost as if they kept it as nothing happened at all. I was told to stop patrolling this area after I saw what it did. Not because I'm afraid of this creature, but it's just because of what happened. I'm told that I need to keep very quiet about these things, and if I speak up, well, more than my career will be on the line. My husband, myself, and our 11-month-old baby were spending the weekend at the Oregon coast. We stayed one night and on the second day decided to just watch the sunset and head back home to Hood River after we ate dinner. It was pretty late by the time we reached Multnomah Falls exit and my husband needed to take a break from driving to get some fresh air. We pulled into the parking lot and there were no other cars at all. We parked our vehicle at the west end of the lower parking lot. Our baby was sleeping in the back seat, and he and I got out of the vehicle to stretch our legs and get some air. It was a pleasantly warm evening and very clear out. Just a few minutes had passed when all of a sudden we heard noise coming from the east end of the lot. We both looked and saw a very large, tall creature coming out of the tunnel where, during the day, people are walking in and out of constantly. It had to duck down to come through and seemed a bit irritated to have to do so. It came out of the tunnel and stood up tall, pivoting to the west and headed our direction. During this entire ordeal, my husband, now X, and I never spoke a word. Our voices fell silent as we both watched this thing head our way. As it came closer, my mind tried to decide what it was. It clearly was not a human, too tall to be that. It was not a bear, as its arms were long and actually hung to around its knees at a full stand. It was not a gorilla, as it walked like a human and was too big to be a gorilla. Process of elimination led me to the only logical conclusion. It was Bigfoot. Without a doubt, it was dead silent. You could have heard a pin drop. Wouldn't rational people jump into their vehicle where their precious child was sleeping and take the hell off? Well, to this day, I can't explain the fact that we both seemed frozen on our feet and could not move or speak. At this time, I recall there was no fear. Absolutely none. Anyway, it approached, and as it walked by us, 
about 20 feet from where we stood. It stopped for just a moment, acknowledged us by turning its head to look and made a sound, and a slightly irritated wave of its right arm. It then quickly lost interest and continued on, its way heading west in the parking lot. We watched in silence as this huge and obviously dark and hairy creature walked up to a cement wall, firmly planted its hands on the wall, and oh so quickly swept its feet and legs right on through as it vanished into the dense forest beyond. Then it was gone. This entire incident lasted only minutes, I'm sure. But living, it seemed to be in slow motion. Once the creature hopped the wall, my husband and I finally looked at each other wide-eyed. All that he said at that moment was, let's get the hell out of here as we got into our vehicle and took off. It wasn't until this moment that I felt physical fear. I began to tremble uncontrollably. My heart was racing at what we had just witnessed. We drove still in silence for a few minutes, and then it seemed that we both at the same moment said to each other, Did you see what I just saw? It was as if we had to confirm it with the other, because it was so unbelievable. Yes, we had indeed both seen the same thing. Thank God. No one would believe this story. He believed me, and I believed him. He also told me that he had no fear until it was gone, just like me. Not once did we feel threatened by it, though it seemed a bit irritated by something. Or did we fear for our sleeping baby in the back seat? Figure that one out. That's my story. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for giving me a chance to share it. When I was attending a university about seven years ago, I found myself in a situation that would forever change how I conducted myself outdoors. When classes got out one January afternoon, the county I was in was hit with an intense blizzard. While it was pretty typical to get snowstorms every week in the winter months in that area, this one lasted a good few days, and we got so much snow that the school gave everyone a heads up that classes would be canceled on Monday and Tuesday at least due to predictions of the storm lasting clear until Sunday night. My roommates and I decided we would get our homework done early so that we could spend the weekend exploring some of the thick woods surrounding the campus. Why would 320 somethings be exploring the woods in three feet of snow, let alone howling winds and freezing temperatures? Well, even I think this sounds ridiculous, looking back on it as a grown man. You see, my college was known for its various arts programs that produced a number of gifted writers, painters, and actors. Over the years, many students fabricated stories and false accounts of various bizarre happenings in those woods, ranging from Bigfoot sightings to ghosts and coven activities. We thought the snow would make for an interesting investigatory experience, so to speak. I figured that if there was indeed some supernatural phenomena going on in the woods, we would see things like disturbances in the snow, and the natural silence of almost no one being outside in the winter terrain meant that we would hear all sorts of strange noises with no commotion. To obscure them. I was generally the reasoner of my group, so no one argued with me. We packed some basic supplies into one of my hiking packs and left just a few minutes shy of noon. Long story short, we accessed the woods from a little-known entrance about 50 meters from the parking lot behind the Liberal Arts Lecture Building and hiked about two kilometers into the woods. The scenery was stunningly gorgeous, with the evergreen pines and invasive maple trees saturated with white dusting and snow covering every inch of the forest floor sometimes high enough to completely conceal the underlying shrubbery. Despite this, the area was rather unspectacular, with only the odd squirrel hopping about in complete silence. Eventually, we decided to hike down to a shallow stream that students referred to as Flinger Creek, so nicknamed for the many students and local residents who would fly fish for brook trout in it during the spring months. There were lots of large rocks along the bank, so we thought we would, you know, roll a couple northwest delights and chill there for a bit. 
Well, we spread an old sheet full of holes and awkward stains on the ground and took our seats, joking about our butts being soaked with freezing snow, water and even colder stones digging into our nethers, as we tried to keep our hands from trembling as we rolled our smokes. Suddenly a dense fog consumed the ravine, and it became hard to see anything further than around a dozen meters from either direction of our blanket. While this happened quite fast, it wasn't exactly unusual to us. After all, we were next to a river with snow piling up above the embankments, so it only made sense that we would get some fog. After a few remarks, we brushed it off and began to toke up. Afterwards, the fog seemed even thicker than before, and as it was nearing three o'clock in the afternoon by this point, we decided to head back before the sun would begin to set, thus dropping the temperature and running the risk of our soaking pants, freezing to our junk. We balled up the sheet, put it back in the backpack, and began to head back. Well, we got lost. We used a fallen tree as a trail marker on the way down to the river, but we actually walked past a tree that happened to have also fallen a few dozen strides from the one we noted. In the spring, this would not have been a big deal, but given the sheer amount of snow everywhere, combined with the fog, we could not really tell which way we were headed. My friends started to bicker amongst themselves while I attempted to get us out of there. Eventually, I decided I needed a cigarette to relax and regain focus, especially given that it was now nearly four o'clock and the sun was beginning to set. I stepped under a tree, and upon sparking my zippo, I noticed that the tree I was under had a bunch of weird hieroglyphs and runes carved into its bark. A lot of times, students would do this to trick hikers into thinking they were near some witch or ancient monster, in order to scare them for fun. But I didn't really pay much mind to this, until I heard some footsteps picking up from all around the tree. I called out, Go of yourself, thinking it was one of my friends trying to scare me. I'm a pretty jumpy guy, honestly. At once, they all called out in protest. They, in fact, seemed to be under a tree several paces in front of me, where they remained since I broke away to smoke. I felt a chill, not from the cold weather, before replying. I heard someone stepping around. It was probably a deer or something. They made a joke about Bambi stalking me and laughed before they fell silent with an eerie promptness. I'm almost done with this guy, I called out, motioning to crush the cigarette but in the snow, before I was halted by one of my friends via a quite drawn, ouch, sheesh, wait. I got that same chill again. I remained faithful, quietly standing there as if waiting for the infantryman to give the signal to push on. I then heard another step. This time it was a little heavier, like a foot intentionally pushing all the way through the snow to meet the frozen ground underneath. A moment later I heard the sound of rapid footsteps go straight past me, picking up in speed as they grew audibly fainter. Jeremy screamed an obscenity. I can't quite recall as the other guys shuffled in the snow suddenly as if they were startled. Bear in mind I could not see them from where I was. But I sprinted ahead, whether in diligence or stupidity I cannot remember, until I tripped over one of them, who was on all fours, struggling to get up. What on earth? I shouted as my comrades shuffled around and got their bearings. I could now see them clearly, and I almost laughed at the sight of powder snow all over their bodies, looking as if they got 86th from a trashy club in. 1986 they were all fumbling their words, which didn't seem to improve, even as all of us returned to upright positions. Then Ron, arguably the most confident and bravest of us, straightened his glasses, sighed, and spoke. I don't know what it was, but something big walked right in your direction. Well, what did it look like? I muttered. Hell if I know. I could barely see the spark of your cancer. Stick in this fog. All I could tell was that it was dark, colored, almost like a shadow, and that it was taller than us. He waved his hand frantically over his head, as if to remind me that he was indeed the tallest of us, and he was at least six feet, and was moving your way. It was nuts. I immediately approached this from my usual philosophical perspective. It was probably a moose, 
We're not supposed to get them this early in the year down here, but hey, my uncle told me about a grizzly bear on his property last summer, and he lives supposedly 200 miles away from grizzly territory. Everyone groaned and sighed in silent agreement that this was probably some big animal, startled by our sudden screaming. At any rate, it was long gone, and we decided to use a compass app on my Android to get to some road that we could then follow back to campus. After about a half hour of walking in the opposite direction, we wound up just to the left of where we entered the woods. We shouted in celebration before heading back to our dorm. Later that night, just shy of midnight, I stepped out of the residence hall to have another smoke. My joints were a little stiff, so I decided to take a stroll. Like a unsung hero revisiting an old battleground, I walked back to the trailhead we took earlier. Looking down it is the shadowy path now looked to be the throat of some great animal, descending into nothingness is in an almost graceful void. I sighed and turned around to head back. My heart skipped a beat and I was speechless. I could not move or scream, only inhale sharply as I witnessed the most terrifying thing I had ever seen. Towering in front of me, at least ten feet tall, was a being as dark as oil with a long and twisting neck extending upward and then curling back down in a supernatural arc, cradling a small oblong skull with a wide gaping mouth. Bearing a bottom row of flat teeth and a strange bony appendage just below what appeared to be a blunted nose, pushed into its face and two beady yet bright silver eyes spaced far apart and sitting on either side of that skull. I could make out no further features of this thing, only that right in the center of its awful, somewhat feathery torso, which seemed surreal and featureless. It held a head bearing a stark resemblance to mine, close to its chest, if it had one. My eyes slowly rolled up to meet this thing's before I fell to the ground, laughing maniacally as snow swirled around us. Every night before I go to sleep, I meditate for approximately 30 minutes. I do this to get into a clear and positive space before dosing off. So as every night before, I started my meditation, and it was pretty uneventful for the most time. I would actually say that it has been the calmest I have felt in quite some time even. However, at the end of my meditation, I felt something heavy pressing down on my body. Like some person was sitting on my shoulders, and as my legs were shackled to the bed, Although it did feel weird, I didn't think too much of it until my body was asleep already, which usually happens before my mind goes blank as well. This time around, my mind did not go blank, though, in my pure calmness, yet uncomfortable feeling of being pushed down. A huge, dark entity with an enormous mouth entered my thoughts. It scared me a bit, but I stayed mindful. The entity came closer, where eventually it swallowed me with ease. Inside the entity's mouth, it was pitch black until a door appeared in the distance. My spiritual side got curious, and without any conscious thought, I walked towards it. I opened the door and got sucked into a fiery red cave where one man was sitting. This man introduced himself as the man that makes deals for a living. Without further introduction, he told me he had a deal for me that I couldn't refuse. He would let my wildest financial, sexual, and goal-oriented dreams come true. In exchange, my place for the throne, he continued that I was to take the deal. No further harm would come to me. Yet if I didn't, he would spook my mind until eternity. Without having said a word myself, he showed me the exit and claimed that he will reappear once more when the time has come. I exited the cave back into the dark. There the entity moved me out of his mouth and disappeared from my thoughts. Ever since this encounter, I have been pondering if I had an encounter with a devil of sorts, or if this was a higher spiritual being trying to warn me. Although the memory of it scares me, it does not make me panic. On the contrary, it brings me peace. But one thing is for sure. I don't know what to make of this situation and am looking for any advice on this.
or someone who experienced the same things as me. I was driving a shortcut from 29 Palms, California to Albuquerque, New Mexico. 29 Palms is located in the desolate high desert east of Los Angeles. The shortcut was all two-lane road through total nothingness except for passing through Amboy Cali. Amboy is a nearly abandoned town nearly as far below sea level as Death Valley with a dormant volcano and lava field on one side and a salt flat on the other. It was also at the time a hot spot for satanic group activity. So I was driving by myself in the afternoon. I stopped in Amboy and snapped a picture of the city sign just to prove I was there to friends who dared me to take that route to a 40. I got back in my car and proceeded to drive up into the mountain range between Amboy and I-40. Once I reach the top, I'm driving north through a canyon with high grass on both sides of the road. Up ahead, I see some stuff in the middle of the road. As I approach, I slow down to see a red Pontiac Fyro stop sideways across both lanes. A suitcase open with clothes scattered everywhere and two bodies laying face down in the road. A man and a woman. I stop a hundred feet or so away and the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. Being a Marine, I reach under the seat and pull out a 9M pistol and chamber around. Something seemed very wrong. It looked too perfect as if it were staged. An ambush? Was I being paranoid? Something was just wrong. Getting out of the car seemed unthinkable. It was a horror movie. Move! Move! As I scanned the road, I saw a line I could drive. Past the guy in the road on his left. Swerve to the right side of the woman, behind the fire roll, and I'd be on the other side. I dropped it into first gear, punched it, and drove the line I planned. I passed the back of the Fiero without hitting it or either of the bodies in the road. I continued forward a couple hundred feet and slowed down so I could breathe and let my heart slow down. As I looked up into the rearview mirror, I saw that the two bodies had gotten up to their knees and twenty or so people emerged from the tall grass on either side of the road by the car and bodies. At that moment, my right foot smashed the gas pedal to the floor and did not let up until I had to slow down for the I-40 East on-ramp. I will never know what would have happened to me had I gotten out of the car to check on the bodies or stopped my car closer to them. Somehow I do not think it would have been good. Sometimes real life can be scarier than a movie. The legends of Whispering Hollow, a small wood area in Yosemite, had always intrigued me, but I never truly believed in cryptids or, or similar creatures. Yet the stories persisted, whispered among the park's visitors, and shared around campfires, a creature simply known as the Beast was said to roam the deepest and most treacherous areas of the park, a shadowy figure that struck fear into the hearts of anyone who dared to venture too close. As a seasoned park ranger, I was used to encountering wildlife and handling challenging situations. However, the rumors of the Beast piqued my curiosity and I found myself drawn to the mystery. Despite the warnings from fellow rangers and locals, I couldn't resist the urge to uncover the truth behind the legend. One fateful morning, I decided to embark on a solo expedition into the heart of Whispering Hollow. Armed with my backpack and a sense of determination, I ventured into the wilderness, following the winding trails that led deeper into the park. The air was thick with anticipation as I delved deeper into the unknown my heart pounding with every step I took. As I navigated through the dense foliage, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. The forest seemed to come alive with hushed whispers, and the trees seemed to shift as if concealing something unseen. I brushed off the unease, attributing it to my imagination playing tricks on me. As the sun began to set, casting eerie shadows across the landscape, I found myself approaching the heart of Whispering Hollow. My senses were on high alert, and every rustle in the undergrowth made me jump. But I pressed on, determined to unveil the truth behind the legend. 
Suddenly, I heard a faint rustling sound, like footsteps approaching. My heart quickened, and I instinctively turned to seek cover behind a large tree. I peered cautiously around the trunk, my eyes widening in disbelief at what I saw. Emerging from the darkness, there it was, the cryptid, a large dark figure walking upright, moving with an eerie grace. It was black and shorter than me, with no visible neck that I could discern. My breath caught in my throat as I observed the creature, trying to make sense of what I was witnessing. It stopped just a few feet away, sniffing the air with its nose pointing up, as if sensing my presence. Fear gripped me like a vice, and I struggled to control my trembling limbs. My irrational mind urged me to retreat, to run back to safety, but an inexplicable curiosity held me in place. I strained to see its eyes, but the creature's face was shrouded in darkness. Its presence felt both ancient and otherworldly, and I couldn't shake the feeling that it was somehow aware of me, watching me with unseen eyes. As I stood frozen in fear, the cryptid turned around and walked away casually in the same manner it had arrived. My heart pounded in my chest, and my mind raced with a jumble of emotions. Had I truly encountered the legendary beast of Whispering Hollow, shaken to my core, I retraced my steps, deciding to leave the wilderness behind and head back to the safety of the park ranger station. My mind was filled with conflicting thoughts, the desire to protect the park's secrets and expose the truth about the illegal loggers now overshadowed my fascination with the cryptid. In the days that followed, I dedicated myself to uncovering the illegal logging operations and exposing the true villains behind the legend of the beast. As I gathered evidence, I realized that the loggers had fabricated the myth to scare people away and cover up their destructive activities within the park. With unwavering determination, I brought the evidence to the authorities, and a series of arrests followed. The illegal logging operations were shut down, and the park was finally safe from their grasp. Though I managed to protect the park from the true threat, I could never forget that chilling encounter with the cryptid. As the years passed, the memory remained etched in my mind, a reminder of the mysteries that lurked within the wilderness. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.